Hello everyone, how are you doing? I know this is a particularly challenging time because I'm between you and drinks. So I'll try to keep the session as interactive and as fun as possible. So who can tell me what a phoenix is? Perfect. So why do we, how do we relate that to security and DevOps? Can you figure it out? We'll kill DevOps and see what comes out. Okay, cool. Yes, sort of. We evolve. So what I tend to call in a more, in a more gentle way is you tend to nudge DevOps and you make it reborn with security at the heart. But I hear a lot of talk about DevOps, DevSecOps, and what the heck is DevSecOps? And I don't feel that, well, I feel that a lot of people tell developers, here's a bunch of tools, now go and have fun with it, and that's DevSecOps. It's not really for me. For me, it's an operating model, how you bring the organization to be aware of security, how do you involve architect and design, how do you do risk management, and that's why I call it DevSecs, or Biz, Risk, and Gov, very long term. But I think these, these terms was, mentioned in one of the panel here. So how do we augment DevOps, DevSecOps, and how do we involve the rest of the organization? So a little trivia for you guys. Can you figure out the number 42, the question that it answered to? Perfect. Oh, wow. I never got, I never got a crowd that <laughs> answered this so quickly. I'm in the right place. Thank you. And let me say, it's an honor to be here. I was there uh, next to probably some of you last year, and I said, this is one of the best conferences I've been to. It's very, I feel like a, a home, so I need to share. I learned a lot from this conference over the past three years, and I came here and said, I need to share my journey. My journey in DevSecOps and, and how we did this transformation in fuel organizations that are very, very antiquated, so it was, a particularly interesting learning curve on how push very antiquated organization into this new world of security and how this journey evolves. So a little bit about uh, what we're gonna talk today. Talk is a little bit compressed, so I'm gonna dive in and dive out and let me know at any specific point if you wanna know more because this is a sharing session, it's sharing knowledge and if you disagree with something, let me know. I'm happy to disagree. I'm happy to argue um, and discuss. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the evolution of DevOps in security and how that evolves in big organization. Then the visibility problem. And I think in a lot of conference about application security, I haven't heard people talking about asset register or the visibility problem. What do you have in production? That for me is such a key concept. And that's what we're gonna talk. And that's why I put this as a number one. Having visibility for me is one of the key things. Then who likes cake? Come on, everybody likes cake. Well, no, not true, but everybody likes sweets. I like sweets. And it's, it's a term that I tend to use to describe the traceability problem. So how do you go from the repository all the way in production and you trace the thing? And I find that talking repository to a board, they kind of look at you, it's like, what the heck are you talking about? So I dump it down and I make the cake, uh, an analogy on the cake. Um, but I'm gonna describe a little bit more, of course, here. <laughs> I'm not gonna dump it down. And then people and trust. So a lot of DevSecOps talk tend to focus on tool. I tend to focus on trust and people and the education and the operating model that we t have, we've implemented in a lot of organization and I'd like to share with you the learning and how we did it and the benefit of it. Then of course, tooling, so scanner, triaging, how do you use the tooling? And then one controversial topic that is maturity matrix. A lot of DevSecOps talk, don't like the term maturity matrix. They say DevSecOps is uh, an opinion, a philosophy, an evolution. I like to guide organization towards a DevSecOps and take it with a pinch of salt there is a number of steps that you go through in the evolution and you can change them, modify them, augment them, but at least the maturity matrix give a guidance, a guardrail. So a little bit about me, 
I'm Francesco Cipollone, I'm Italian, hence I'm gonna talk a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm the director of NSC42. We are a VC, so company. We uh, also operate in application security and cloud security. I'm very passionate about cloud security, and hence why I headed up the um, Cloud Security Alliance for UK and Ireland chapter. We do a lot of uh, meetups and we're restarting a lot of education in, uh, in England and we're based in London. I tend to stress the fact in any of my talk about two key things. Security is everybody's job. And with DevSecOps, that resonate a lot with developers. But I like also to bring the rest of the organization together. So architect, security architect, People that does risk management, they don't tend to go close to the code or close to these kind of things. Product owner, product manager, I tend to say, security is part of your job. You need to understand a little bit about security to know where do you operate. And coming back to us, a security expert, actually, let me ask, who is in security here? Okay, who is in development? Okay. Who is in other part of the organization, like governance, risk management, board? Cool. So, for security professional, I keep on telling myself, I need to make things easy, things smooth. I can't create process that then people can't implement, or too cumbersome, or too complicated thing. Even if you look at the simplest aspect, that is policy. In a lot of organizations that I walk in, I see the policy community to be completely disconnected from people that actually implement the policy. And what that result into? Can you figure it out? Will the policy get implemented? People tend to go around it, so it's completely useless. It's a piece of paper. So how do we codify policy? How do we codify requirement? And how do we give these people feedback? And what we're creating is a feedback loop that is the same principle that DevSecOps, but applied in all the parts of the organization to create a coherent ecosystem. So again, what the heck is DevOps? Who has been, who knows about the term DevOps or DevSecOps? Raise of hands. Okay, I don't need to explain. But just to level set, I like to say just one single thing about DevSecOps. For me, it's going fast with confidence and promoting good quality code. And good quality code I don't specifically say security, I say good quality, because for me, security is part of quality. So, dev, pure, plus ops, plus security. And I think the term was, who remembers where the DevOps terms was born? Who can tell me where the DevOps terms were kind of created? 2009? Velocity conference? No? That's, that's, I think, the 10 release per day. That's where the DevOps was created. And it's a long time ago. And we're still struggling to apply the concept. But anyway, Phoenix, security. I tend to represent the various parts of a Phoenix in this way, and, 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 I'll exp and I'll explain in a second why. So for me, the key pillars of an application security program are touching point on security design, build and test, at the heart, security operation, then you have at the head, people and education, and then you have governance and risk management. These are for me the key pillars of any application security program should cover and should touch, and we should do something about this. And I mention it in this specific form because if you remove, if you don't do a secure design, can a bird fly without a wing, with just a wing? probably flaps around, it doesn't fly very well. Without a heart, definitely not. Without the head, definitely not. So if you remove any piece of these elements from any kind of program, then you cripple the program and it's destined to fail or to partially succeed. So I could spend a lot of time talking and we can explore different areas, but this talk is specifically focused on build and test people in education, and then we touch point on governance and some part of risk management. So, problem landscape. Why do we do security? Why do we do security nowadays? Well, I'd like to say, I like this slide. 
Can you mention if you had an account in any of these organizations? I had 14 of those, 14 breaches. That's why I keep on saying security is everybody's problem because we all get affected by it in a way or another. And we might be part of any of these organizations. So protecting this organization is like protecting our own data because we might be affected by any of these. And I like to say this is the scale of some of those breaches. And in orange is the breaches that had particular impact on society. So we keep on facing that every and every day. And we talk about a lot about application security, but I like to stress the fact that a lot of organization, not every organization develops code. A lot of organizations they interact with have third party software, executable. So the principle about just code security, DevOps, it kind of apply and it kind of doesn't. I think Jim Manico before was saying, don't trash penetration testing because it's important. Business logic will not be tested by an automated tool. So DevOps is important, but also consider the picture as a whole. So the visibility problem. Stepping into production and not knowing what do you have or where it come from. I tend to come with an analogy. It's like walking into a room full of broken glass. You walk, you kind of feel crickling, but you don't know the extent of the problem. And you don't know what, how bad it is. So maybe you test one, one of those specific problems with your feet, and you shine a light there, and you say, there is a problem, but you don't know how problematic the situation is in the whole room. So I tend to say, let's shine a light. Let's have complete visibility in production. And then we're going to touch traceability. But having visibility is really a powerful tool because you know the kind of problem you're sitting on, and then immediately you can prioritize. Now, shining a light is really complicated, especially in big organizations that inherit a lot of defect, a lot of problems, a lot of old stuff. Documentation get lost. Things get deployed, nobody want to touch them, nobody want to test it because it might be crippling. You have an old mainframe, they might die. Anybody had experience with those kind of things, like trying to probe some stuff and crippling it over? No? You were very lucky. <laughs> I tested certain things and they, they died on me. And the answer that I received is, well, we never touched for that specific reason. And I say, well, that's a problem because you kind of have a crippling software that you rely on and you don't know when it's going to die. So shine a light on that problem, shine a light on all the production. And I tend to say software development is kind of a supply chain, it's kind of a um, convey belt. You take raw material, you build it together something, you build together a product, and then you ship it into production. But if you don't know where you build this product from, if you don't have a clear picture about the source of your product or your repository or your library, third party stuff, how do you actually aggregate this thing? And then you don't know where you deploy, then you're kind of blind. Then you're kind of just trying different things. And this might be a utopia, having a, a warehouse where you shine a light and where you have absolutely knowledge about where each component of your software comes from is a little bit of utopia, I have to say. I like utopia, but it's not realizable. So prioritize stuff. Have, for example, anything that is web-facing, I want to know what it looks like and where it comes from and where I build those kind of things. And then move forward and forward and deeper inside the organization. Do assessment and learn more about. But the ultimate goal is having a clear picture because at that point, you can clearly point a finger and say, the problem is there, or the problem was there. And the problem of traceability is a big problem. Knowing where stuff that you had deployed in production comes from. Does it come from a third party? Does it come from a library that was built by somebody else? Anybody has experienced an account takeover on a third party library or heard about it? How big is that problem? Yeah. So British Airways was 
attack like that. It's like a complete invisible code. Somebody compromised a library that was built inside the Java code that was running on the client. So they had no, absolutely no way to trace that problem back to the originator. But if they had the knowledge of that code running from somewhere else and at least do dependency check, that is a fantastic OWASP tool, at least they could have known something popped somewhere. Now, that was a specific, very, very clear target, but I assume that we're going to see more and more of that because it's a really, really clever way to attack an organization. And we depend more and more, or at least from my experience, I see more and more open source software being built in in applications. It's easy. It's a library. I pick and take it and implement it. But then the consequence is I don't know the dependency. I don't know the extent of the dependency. That library may be composed of other functions. So dependency check traceability is key, understanding the traceability. And I keep on saying it's like traceability problem is like baking a cake. So if you break it down in, two, in three phases, you start on the design. You start with a recipe. The recipe has components or raw ingredients. Then you go and you bake it. You put them together. And then you sell it. On, you put it on the shelf and you sell it. Now, assume you are a health inspector. Not a very fun job, I guess. Well, at least you can interact with cake. You can eat the cake. So assume you need to identify what's wrong in each phase or, or certify that the bakery shop is actually doing their job right. So you go and say, show me the receipt that you bake the cake or you build the cake with. And show me the ingredient and the traceability of the ingredients to the cake. And demonstrate that those ingredients are not expired. If you don't have the traceability from the cake that was sold all the way to the ingredient that were baked with and the expiry date, you're probably not going to be able to see, to say, if a specific product, if a specific cake was poisonous, was dangerous. So that's, that's a very simple way that I tend to describe the traceability problem. Understand the raw ingredient, if they're expired or not, and test if you have way to look at those things in the various phases. So in the design, look at how the ingredients are put together, the, re the recipe. In the build and test, trace it back. What is not expired today might expire tomorrow, might have vulnerability tomorrow. And in production, something might pop. Some vulnerability, some component that wasn't vulnerable yesterday will be, will be vulnerable tomorrow. So the other element that I use is the ABCND of application security. So step number A, identify, trace. Software that you built, how do you build it? Have an asset register, all the components that you have. Maybe it's a utopia having a complete asset register of all the components that you have, but maybe the major component, maybe Apache, maybe any web service that you use, maybe any component that you use, any library that you use, and how do you trace? Software that you buy, where do you buy it from? And I keep on hammering on asset register or identifying the components that you build in because then you have a picture of how you build your software. And anybody move on B, detect, scan. How do you think scanning works usually? Who runs SAST or DAST or MAST or IST experience? Where do you run those codes against? Well, sorry, where do you run those tools against? Okay, that refers to the CI Okay, so that usually is again some code, some repository. So if you don't know how your software is built, probably your pipeline can tell you, but if you don't know how that software is built, how do you trace the built product to the scan that you've done? Unless you're very mature and you break the build and say, I'm not going to accept any software that is vulnerable, but how many times can you? Fail the build, can you break the build before a client starts screaming at you? Who has broken a build? 
Okay, how many times? How many? Okay, fair enough. You, you are the lucky one that can say that product can go in production. That's a very mature organization or a good maturity of organization. But a lot of clients that interact and start the journey, I, told them, I tell them, I'm going to break the build. I'm not going to let your developer develop stuff that is insecure. And they look at me, it's like, nah, never going to happen. And you have to accept that they need to make a balance between going in production, going in the market, that's a risk, and going in the market with vulnerable software, that's another risk. They have to balance risk against risk, and ultimately it's their decision to say, I'm not gonna break the build, but it's my responsibility, it's our responsibility as security to at least inform them and show this application was built by this component, and they have this, this level of vulnerability, this number of vulnerability, now it's up to you to decide. Now, at a certain point, I might say, well, maybe if I look at one individual component and it has 10 vulnerability, I can accept it. But if a software is built by 10 repository and each repository have, I don't know, 10 critical, 10 high from your library, from the uh, static code analysis, do you think they're gonna accept that? Less likely. If you aggregate the vulnerability in software that you built, and where it comes from, and you aggregate that number, I'm telling you, it's much easier to have the discussion of you narrate this risk instead of looking at the individual problem on the specific build. And have it traced back. And this takes me to point number C, visualize. Visualize the vulnerability. If a team is uptrending in level of vulnerability or downtrending in level of vulnerability, have that historic data, because that might tell you a lot of stuff. For me, what it tells me is, is a team getting better? Do they lack some information? So if they keep on doing the same error over and over about, I don't know, serialization or input validation, or they I keep on finding cross-site scripting problem in their code, that tells me an information, a critical information that I need to train them. I need to do something specific on that specific problem. So data-driven education. But you can only have a discussion with, unfortunately, your management team or, or your organization if you visualize the vulnerability. You can only have the argument of this team is actually introducing more and more and more vulnerability over time. They might tell me that they're ignoring security problem completely, or their product manager is not giving the team enough time. That tells you, that gives you a lot of data points that you can have an argument, a discussion with your management team. Establish clear KCI or KPI, so key information or key element that you measure. How many high, how many medium, how many low do you have? Display them, uptrending, downtrending. Another element that a little bit mature organization that I tend to do in mature organization is balance build versus fix. If you dump, for example, if you do study code analysis against a build or against a, a repository, all the output, assuming that you sanitize, and we're gonna see later how you sanitize, all the output, all the problem, you dump it in a ticketing system. And then all the new use stories, you dump it in a ticketing system. And you go to the product owner and you say, you need to maintain a healthy balance between what you build, new use stories, and what you fix. And if you display that healthy balance and you unify that with the downtrending or uptrending, if they keep a good threshold, means they give enough time to team to actually fix vulnerability. And that is reflected by, are they introducing vulnerability, yes or no? These two indicators tells you a lot of stories about team. If they have time to develop and to fix vulnerability, if their product owner is pushing them to build, 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 and ignoring completely the security tool, and you can create threshold saying, if you're above this trending of build versus fix, you maintain the application. It's your responsibility. It, doesn't go, it goes in operation, but we segment it off, and it's your responsibility. And that's a mature organization that does that. 
I haven't seen it done a lot of time. Probably just, I've seen it done in Google, but not in a lot of other places. But that's the nirvana when you say the product owner is completely responsible of the life and death of an application. It does a risk assessment. Do I need to go in production fast? Why? And then respond and recover. So schedule vulnerability in JIRA, in any ticketing system, prioritize them, do, a, do an assessment, prioritize what vulnerability should be fixed first. And you can do that in a very basic way. Vulnerability, CWE or CBE, whatever you prefer and like, which one is more dangerous? And then of course, fixing it, fix the vulnerability, measure how many vulnerability get fixed over time. If you dump the vulnerability or if you dump the ticket inside Jira, you can measure the evolution of that. And that takes us to the vulnerability life cycle, vulnerability management life cycle. So as I said, discover the vulnerability with the software asset register where you trace it back and then scan the code or dependency or library or whatever. Assess, try, uh, prioritize. So do a basic triage. Is a false positive, is not a false positive. Then start prioritizing. Is, my, is one of my critical application that I'm looking at? Is it web facing? How important is that application? How much money does it generate? Those are key factors that you can use to prioritize vulnerability. That is not just your traditional high, medium, and low, but you start talking to an organization about risk management. How important is that application to them? So you don't talk in abstract term, but you talk in money term. And if you're particularly courageous, assign a money number to each vulnerability, aggregate that and saying, this is your vulnerability debt in terms of money. It's a really powerful tool to a product owner to see an aggregate number. It's the only thing, most of the organization think about numbers, about money that they wanna make. If you monetize the vulnerability, you have a very powerful argument. Then visualize gra uh, graphic, gra create graph, downtrending, uptrending, build versus fix, schedule it, fix it, and test the fix. That's a very simple life cycle. So a little bit about the life cycle, and I go a little bit more in depth. So it's, it's nothing different that we just saw. So on the left, you have the various categories of assets. Then scan the code, aggregate, visualize, triage the vulnerability, remediate, and resolve. Very simple life cycle with some detail. So I'm going to explore quickly the various phases, and then we can open to question. So what can you use to trace what you build to where you build it from? And which team actually build? Anybody use Git in here? Okay. Have you ever used the committer to trace back a specific vulnerability to a Jira element? Okay. There's a simple comment to actually get dump all the latest committers from a repository. You do that for every repository. You see who was the last person who touched the code you see which team it belongs to, that probably is a very simple exercise in an HR database with an email address. And then you relate that to Jira, you dump where is this user assigned to in terms of projects. It's a very easy to channel a vulnerability scan in a Git to the team Jira. And that's what I've used in, in a lot of organizations that start from zero, don't have that traceability. That's an easy way to guess what you have deployed, where, do we, where is that Jira, where is that team? People and technology, I tend to break it down into two elements. This is uh, a sequence of scanners and where do I scan and where do normal organizations scan code. So if we start from the very left, we have repository. You have static code analysis, you do the scan. Then you go, you could do that in the CI CD or you could point the, secu the, the static scanner directly to the repository. Then when you build, you scan the build. 
a testing, a testing phase. And then production, you test production, uh, application in production. Once you've done that, you can aggregate the result in visualization dashboard. And I like to keep the production dashboard different from the development dashboard. For me, the priority of a vulnerability in the, during development phase is very, very different than in production. In production is something that is burning, it's live, somebody could exploit it, has a higher priority. In development phase, I like team to actually visualize if they're uptrending, downtrending, what, do, what are the vulnerabilities that they're introducing so that they can fix them. But I'm not stressing too much about the priority. And then set target against the threshold that they have to maintain in production and in development. And they might be very different targets, much more strict in production, much more lax in development. So this is just a quick example of one of the, um, the way we built one of those visualization tools. So we created, um, we created a bunch of uh, Python script that extracted the information, the high, medium, and low from uh, the static code analysis, the uh, dynamic code analysis, the dependency check. We dump it in our Postgres database and we start visualizing element in a Grafana. And this is more or less how it looks one of those. And then we start discussing, okay, what is a threshold that we can impose a team that we all agree on? It's very easy for, to establish, I'm not gonna have any critical vulnerability or high vulnerability or medium vulnerability. But it's much more powerful if you look at overall the code and what is reasonable. And then you lower the bar, the more the team get, the better the team gets, the lower is the bar. Now, triaging. I like to divide the triaging in a maturity level. So you start from a very basic where you say high, medium, and low. And also, I would like to highlight at the very bottom the team that I involved during the triage. So it's not just a developer team, but it's also the architect, security people, risk people. And if you look at from the very left, you start with the high, medium, and low, so very basic assessment. And that's probably something, a conversation that you have with developers. But then if you move towards the right, where you start considering is the application web facing? What is the priority of the application? How much money does the application generate? Those are questions that developers normally don't have information on. So you start involving more architect, more part of the organization where you get those information too. And that's how you get more part of the organization involved in the triaging of vulnerability. And they start getting that empathy towards the security team and the development team. They start saying, Ah, that's a risk, and this is why it's a risk, and this is the impact. You start creating that empathy feeling. So, trust and verify. Who heard the term before? Cool. So, you trust the development team, you keep the dashboard, and you verify if they're uptrending, downtrending, and so on. And you give them the license to operate. So, you give the team freedom to go in production, as long as they maintain a healthy balance between the number of vulnerabilities that they introduce and the fix and the rate of fix. So we created in some of our client a database that aggregates if a team is doing the security training, if they're maintaining a healthy balance between the new use stories and the security stories. And if they're maintaining if they are consistently going downtrending and they're not hitting their target for threshold. And this gives automatically the team the ability to deploy an operation, hence not breaking the build. These are much more powerful than breaking each one, each build. It's saying your team is actually doing security right. I'll give you the license to go in production. As soon as you break one of those criteria, your license gets removed. You can't deploy anymore in production unless we apply some more governance. We review your code. It's a bit more challenging to create, but it's more powerful because you empower team to do more security. Education and awareness. So 
do education and awareness for your organization, but for the developers, craft training based on the data that you extract from the scanning tool. So if you're, if you're finding SQL injection, cross-site scripting, do a session of training two, three months on that and then verify if those kind of problems keep on appearing. The training might be wrong, they might not get the problem, but you start having data-driven training instead of just the silly training that you push on development team. And it makes the training entertaining. So do CTF and reward the team. It's much cheaper to reward the team with a cake than doing a bug bounty, right? And if they test their own code, if they test each other's code, it's much better to have an internal bug bounty rather than an external bug bounty. So I mentioned and I'll wrap up the maturity model. So I like to display the various areas and this one, the maturity model that you see here, is just a cut down version of a bigger maturity model that involves each single step that I recommend teams to do in the various areas. This one is specifically build and test. So if you see it's five level of maturity, you get better at it and you aim for the organization to move from one block to the other. And also I establish what I measure based on the maturity. There is no point of measuring maturity number five, license to operate, bill versus fix, uh, high achievable threshold, if I don't have any data point where I can pick up those information. Right? What's the point of mandating a measurement that I can't apply or it doesn't make sense at that maturity level? In that way, you create a guided path for team to develop and get better at. So just to wrap it up, A, B, C, and D, asset register, scan code, visualize and have that kind of discussion, respond, prioritize, recover, fix. We touch on trust and verify, so trust team and verify. Vulnerability management, make it part of everyday life. Automation versus people. I talked a very little about tooling in here. I talk about operating model because that's what's missing, I think, in DevSecOps. <coughs> do data-driven education. It's pointless to push team to just do training that is not useful then. And do governance at scale by looking at trending, by looking at threshold, not just auditing code, but just putting target to team. I'd like to thank everybody. And I'm a big believer in giving back to the uh, community. So me and Zoe actually have every two weeks, I know the time is sometimes wrong, but we have a mentoring Monday call where we try to explain to team how to start in security and cover different aspects. So we've done probably half of the board of OWASP, the new board of OWASP. We interview a lot of people. We have done session on application security, session on pen testing. We've done months where um, we focus on specific subjects. Uh, most of the episodes are available on YouTube. I hope it is useful and the call is live. So we ask questions dynamically to people that we interview. So it's a bit of a different form of podcast. Um, as a Cloud Security Alliance, I know that uh, it's a bit far, but we sponsor an award. So if you are operating in cloud or if you want to put anybody that you think is an influencer in cloud, this particular person in cloud security, we run an award, we sponsor this, uh, this award. And do we have time? Yeah, so I'd like to open the floor to question because no presentation has no question. Any question? Was everything clear? Uh, was the maturity model you referenced something that is publicly available or? I'm going to make it available. So right now the maturity model was based. So I started the maturity model in a very simple way. It was an exercise to display how team can get better. And then I start asking myself, well, it's actually it was a Twitter. Um, it was a tweet that uh, we started with Jim and other, another part of the uh, OWASP family, that we start questioning, is there anything available to measure software quality? And it, um, 
PSIM and OWASUM were the two reference models. So I start mapping the maturity model to these two reference. I found that those two are very cumbersome because it involves governance design, it involves a lot of aspects. So if you present that to organization that has never started in that field, they find it overwhelming. So if you've seen, the maturity model is very cut down, but I'm gonna publish it soon, as soon as it gets validated by a number of clients. Any other question? Everything clear? I can make a comment. So I actually uh, worked on an application security team, uh, specifically for eBay. And mm -hmm. they actually did follow quite a few of the steps that you mentioned. So we had two parallels to that team. One was where they built out a elastic continuous delivery pipeline where they implemented uh, their own static and dynamic analysis scanners, Fantastic. baked that into a CI CD pipeline. We had vulnerability triaging through external bug, bug bounties and then our inter internal pen testers and established a security champions and awareness program where we contacted and reached out to developers external product owners and stakeholders uh, and kind of had a essentially point of contact for each team and that way us as the application security team, the second parallel to that team, we could interface with such a security champion and make sure that, hey, are you guys remediating the, remediating the vulnerabilities based off P0 to P2, right? So assigning classifications on risk mm -hmm. uh, with P0 being so, something like a SQL injection, imminent data being lost, leading to a lot of money, monetary damage. So I think that you make really good points overall and security is everyone's but it's, job. It's, so. How long did it take to get to that point? So I mean, eBay is a more mature organization and I was just an intern. So mm -hmm. I, I only know kind of one side of it, but uh, I, I know that they kind of revamped a lot of their overall um, organization for security. And I think part of that was due to the 2014 related breach that did happen. Fair so. But they, so, do a lot, they do a lot of software development. A lot yes, of the organization they where they operate in, financial mostly, I still find COBOL. So do threat modeling on COBOL and mainframes. It's very, very difficult. Or application that is client server. It's very, very challenging to find, to adapt a DevSecOps model or a software developed application security program to that. But it's important to take into consideration all these single nuances. Because otherwise you say, I'm gonna do an application security program, we're secure. And the important application are actually software that they don't control, that you can't test. And that's why I go back to, I, I fundamentally agree with Jim that you need to have still the manual assessment, the pen test of an application, that form part of the application lifecycle because uh, executable application that you buy are fundamentally part in production. Sometimes it's just the application that you use every day. Any other question? I know that I'm between you and the drinks and the sun. Can okay. we get a round of applause, please? Thank you, everybody. It was an honor. <laughs> <laughs>